A very good morning to everyone. I warmly welcome you all this Sunday morning to another program of our CPD programs co-organized by the Government Medical Officers Association and the Society for Health Research and Innovation. Our webinar link will be available to you from 9 a.m. to 9.50 to join in and no late attendees will be entertained thereafter. Each attendee should have been attended till the end of the webinar to obtain the e-certificate of participation that has valid CPD points that are strictly adhered to the NCCPD guidelines. The link will be posted at the end of the session. There will also be a chat box open for your queries where we will discuss at the end of the session and we kindly ask you all to join in by muting your microphone and switching off your video to avoid any interruptions during this webinar. Without further ado, I would like to introduce to you our speaker for the day. Today's topic is treatment options for liver cancers. And we have Dr. Prabhat Kumar Singer, who is the consultant surgeon specializing in hepatobiliary systems all the way from BGH Manor. Over to you, sir. So uh, it can be uh, either primary neoplasms or it can be metastasis from uh, a distal, distant organ. So, uh, so this is a picture of a uh, hepatocellular carcinoma in the background of a, a cirrhotic liver. So uh, if you can see the picture, there's a elevated uh, area which looks like a tumor that is a hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, the background of the liver looks very uh, irregular and uh, it's cirrhotic. So uh, most uh, primary, when we take, talk about the primary liver tumors, mainly it's hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma. So hepatocellular carcinoma is most common type of primary liver cancer and uh, major causes are uh, alcohol induced or currently the emerging uh, problem is a non-alcoholic fatty liver. Uh, there are research done in Sri Lanka, about 40% of patients having non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So it's an emerging problem. And uh, in a few years time, there'll be a lot of people uh, turning into cirrhotics after uh, NASH and developing primary liver tumors. And hepatitis C, it is actually uh, now being uh, controlled and it's being cured uh, due to uh, uh, medical therapy and uh, it's, uh, hepatitis B virus also being uh, uh, controlled due to vaccination. So uh, in the rest of the world, in the Europe mainly, it was initially the viral hepatitis was a problem now, but in our part of the country, it's mainly alcohol and uh, fatty liver disease is uh, other leading causes. And uh, rarely, primary biliary cholangitis or ultimately lead to hepatocellular calcium. That's a bit rare. And uh, if you talk about tumor specific fa factors, uh, it is the most common uh, primary liver tumor and third most common cause of cancer related death worldwide. And uh, the major clinical prognostic indicators are. Uh, multifocality, vascular invasion, and extrahepatic spread. Uh, tumor size, I'll talk about tumor size a bit later. And uh, if you talk about prognostic factors, uh, so there are number of, uh, the number of tumors, say uh, it's bad to have like uh, more than one tumor that is multifocal, and that's a bad sign. And uh, vascular invasion, either microvascular or uh, macrovascular invasion like main portal vein branch or main hepatic artery branch involvement is a uh, virulent feature of a uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. And tumor size itself is not a uh, is not a uh, risk factor. Uh, I mean, not a bad sign, but it's a surrogate marker marker for vascular invasion. The larger the larger the tumor, uh, the possibility of vascular invasion is more. And ultimately, the aggressive tumor biology uh, are the factors uh, which determine the prognosis in a hepatocellular carcinoma. So, multifocal disease, uh, there are different theories. Uh, so, it can be due to two biological mechanisms. Uh, 
uh, one process is that there are multiple you know, tumors, like there are different tumors arising in the liver uh, at the same time, or it may be due to intrahepatic uh, metastasis or kind of satellite lesions. And uh, if you talk about the presentation of hepatocellular carcinoma, uh, so most patients with hepatocellular carcinoma are asymptomatic. It's a, the, a, the picture I showed you before. Uh, that patient uh, is a 67-year-old presented with uh, uh, non-specific symptoms like uh, he had uh, loss of appetite, loss of weight. So when we imaged and we found out that he's a cirrhotic and he's having a uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. So um, mostly the liver tumors, uh, mainly hepatocellular carcinomas are asymptomatic. They may be having uh, symptoms of cirrhosis like uh, ascites and uh, features of chronic liver cell disease. So uh, if the liver cancer stage is advanced, only they would present with symptoms. So other features like uh, abdominal pain due to capsular stretch, anorexia, weight loss, and palpable mass when they are when they are very big lesions uh, may be presenting uh, symptoms. And features of decompensation, as I told you before, like varicose bleeding, uh, worsening ascites, coagulopathy, jaundice may be presenting features of uh, chronic liver cell disease as well as a presence of a hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, <clears throat> so the other uh, uh, interesting thing is that some patients present with acute abdominal pain uh, with bleeding uh, due to excesses which are subcapsular and this can be life-threatening. So this is the BCLC staging system. Uh, this would categorize the hepatocellular carcinoma into a very early stage intermediate and advanced stage and the treatment strategies are mainly guided through the, this uh, BCLC staging system. So if you talk about liver resections, so hepatic resection or liver resection is mainly indicated in patients with early hepatocellular carcinoma. So uh, and these patients performance status should be good and there should be satisfactory liver function. So uh, when we are considering a liver resection in a uh, patient with uh, cirrhosis, there are a few factors coming into play. The patient factors are the patient performance status and uh, and the liver factors. Like uh, So when we remove part of the liver, the rest of the liver can be able to take up the uh, needs of the body and it should not go into liver failure. So there are these factors should be uh, taken into consideration uh, to have a favorable outcome. So mainly BCLC early stage uh, uh, liver cancers, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma can be uh, resected safely without any problem. So, as I uh, talked to you before about vascular invasion, which is being a bad prognostic uh, sign, it is one of the best predictors of outcome following surgery for HCC. Say, now we resect a part uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, and the histology comes as there is microvascular or macrovascular invasion, which is a bad sign. And uh, even if we do uh, hepatic resections uh, with patients who have portal vein uh, tumor thrombosis, their overall survival, tiger survival is very less, about 10 to 11 percent. And uh, I mean, uh, we have done resections of uh, HCC which, uh, uh, with a tumor thrombus in uh, main portal veins, but their long term survival is uh, not very good. And extra hepatic spread. Uh, including regional lymph nodes and bone meds, lung meds uh, are contraindications for surgery. And a little bit about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. It's an emerging problem uh, even in Asia and in Sri Lanka. Like most other people are having fatty liver. So the uh, killer thing about this is absence of cirrhosis in this, uh, even though there's uh, no established cirrhosis, about 50% of patients with uh, NACO can develop HCC. And uh, American Association for Study of Liver Disease uh, currently do not recommend screening of patients with fatty liver disease uh, unless they have established uh, cirrhosis or fibrosis. 
So uh, what we should do is if a patient, uh, I mean, there are a lot of uh, radiologists, they would give a grade two fatty liver or grade one fatty liver. So we have to uh, assess these patients completely and we can uh, put them on a diet program and uh, reduce a carbohydrate diet and, uh, and lipid lowering diet. And so these patients should be subjected to fibro scans to assess whether there is established fibrosis in the liver. So if, the, uh, if there stays three fibrosis, these patients should be on a routine HCC surveillance program to detect the uh, emergence of uh, new tumors. So uh, current recommended uh, guidelines for HCC surveillance is uh, that uh, we have to do ultrasonography uh, either with or without AFP every six months. So, uh, and uh, it, uh, because it will allow us to detect early lesions. And uh, in patients who have advanced cirrhosis, like child uh, class C, uh, it is not necessary to uh, screen these patients because uh, their survival is anyway uh, determined by the uh, degree of liver disease. So uh, there's no point screening for a hepatocellular cancer unless they are on a liver transplant program. So, uh, as we all know, alpha beta protein is the most frequently used tumor marker for hepatocellular carcinoma. And it's alpha beta protein more than 20 uh, uh, is uh, considered uh, a positive level. And uh, interestingly, about, uh, it is negative in about 40% of patients with HCC. So, it's, uh, being alpha beta protein being normal doesn't mean that a patient is not having a hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, it is when elevator is used to uh, assess the response to treatment and to follow up. So uh, in a patient, if, if you're suspecting any liver tumor, the investigation of choice is uh, triphasic CT, so which has an arterial phase, which uh, at 35 seconds and portal venous phase and a leg phase at three minutes. And in doubtful cases, abdominal MRI can be uh, done. So uh, in HCG, the uh, characteristic feature is uh, early arterial enhancement and early washout. Uh, so if we have these features uh, with, uh, in a cirrhotic background, we can confidently diagnose that patient is having a hepatocellular carcinoma. Usually this characteristic uh, imaging is well seen in tumors more than uh, one centimeter or more than two centimeters. And, uh, uh, if these features are absent, uh, the other uh, important thing is, so if you do an interval scan at uh, six months, if there's a 50% size increase in any lesion, so it can be considered as a uh, primary liver tumor. So as I told you before, to diagnose uh, radiological criteria, uh, to coincident imaging, uh, shows typical enhancement, which I should uh, inform you before. And or alpha beta protein more than 400 with a single typical uh, enhancement pattern is diagnostic of a uh, HCC. So uh, for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, early stage hepatocellular carcinoma in patients in child with child's A cirrhosis, uh, resection is a curative therapy, right? And it gives a five-year survival approximately 70%. And the uh, size or number of tumors are not a limitation, but uh, lesions more than three are considered high, high risk in the sense uh, they would recur even after surgery. So, uh, however, the multifocal and uh, multifocal is an macrovascular invasion are features of uh, High risk of high, high risk of recurrence. So even though there is macrovascular invasion, the surgery is still possible. But the long term outcome, as I uh, told you before, about five years survival is about ten to fifteen percent. So a bit about liver transplants. Uh, so uh, liver transplantation is the treatment of choice for HCC, as we all know, because even in child's A or early stage cirrhosis. So when there's established cirrhosis, there's always risk, even if you remove the hepatocellular carcinoma, there is uh, 
pre-emergence in uh, some part of the liver. So the best treatment is to for, uh, is the liver transplant. So uh, not only that, the, uh, these cirrhotic patients they have other problems like established portal hypertension and decompensation. So these all can be contracted if we subject a patient to a liver transplant. And after transplant, the uh, four years survival is about 85% and they can live normal life uh, uh, span if a su successful uh, transplant happens, right? So currently uh, uh, we go by Milan criteria to select uh, transplant uh, uh, recipients, but in the rest of the world, uh, they transplant beyond uh, Milan criteria and there is no size cri criteria for HCG. If the tumor biology is favorable, alpha fetal protein level is less than 1000, so they would consider uh, liver transplantation. And uh, so, initially, so we talked about surgical options, mainly resection and liver transplant. So what are the other therapies available for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma? These are called loop regional therapies. So uh, mainly ablative techniques, uh, use of different uh, thermal and uh, ultrasonic emer uh, microwave energy uh, to ablate the tumor cells. So uh, there, is, there are a few options like microwave ablation, uh, radio frequency ablations. So usually uh, lesions uh, under three centimeter are uh, subjected to ablation. And uh, it is uh, the, if you ablate a lesion which is less than three centimeter, that is almost equal to surgery. So uh, then the other option is that arterially directed therapy. So these are commonly used one in uh, our country's taste, trans arterial chemo embolization. So the procedure is that uh, you would selectively cannulate a vessel, uh, the hepatic artery branch, and uh, uh, chemo uh, drugs are uh, sent through the uh, uh, arterial branches. So that is called trans arterial chemo embolization, which would cause, uh, which can give a good tumor control. And uh, TAR is trans arterial radio embolization, so that uh, you would uh, inject uh, yttrium to uh, cause uh, induce radiotherapy inside the lesion and cause tumor control. Right. And also, the other options are external beam radiotherapy, so uh, and the stereotactic body radiation can be used as other options for hepatocellular puzzle. So, patients who are uh, beyond this uh, treatment in multifocal disease or in macrovascular invasion or patients with child B cirrhosis, uh, they can be subjected to uh, systemic therapy. So currently uh, uh, in our setting, we are using sorafenam and uh, lenotinab can be also used. So sorafenam is the first line therapy for uh, those with advanced hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, and it also can be used as a bridging, uh, like patients who are in, on waiting list for transplant, uh, sometimes it can be used. And overall survival in uh, sorafenab, it's about 10 months and uh, versus a placebo. So it gives a survival benefit in patients with uh, multifocal disease. So, uh, uh, so I talked about hepatocellular carcinoma. Now I would like to talk about uh, cholangiocarcinoma, which is a, another primary liver cancer which occurs, in, uh, occurs. So there are three types of cholangiocarcinomas. Intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, where it occurs in the liver parenchyma. And uh, hilar cholangiocarcinoma, where uh, the cholangiocarcinoma develops in the bile duct near the hepatic hilar. And distal cholangiocarcinoma, it's towards, towards the pancreas uh, uh, within the bile duct, it develops a uh, Cholangiocarcinoma. So, uh, out of all, uh, perihilar cholangiocarcinomas are the commonest, about 50%, and intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas is about 10%. So, if you talk about intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, uh, management of choice is surgery, and uh, surgery is the only option that would uh, end on cure. So, uh, as compared to HCG, tumor size, multiple quality vascular invasion are all are prognostic factors in uh, cholangiocarcinomas as well. 
and tumor size is associated with uh, increased nodal involvement and vascular involvement. So, uh, larger the tumor, it is uh, bad. So, uh, a bit about hyalocholangiocarcinoma. So, it usually uh, affects the bile ducts near the hepatic hilum and it uh, can uh, go either into the right hepatic duct or left hepatic duct. And uh, uh, the critical thing about this hyalocholangiocarcinoma is that uh, it is closely associated with hepatic pathway and portal vein, and there is early vascular invasion. So in this picture, it shows that uh, there is a, uh, you can see the pointer, there's a uh, bile duct cancer here, which involves a uh, left portal vein. So we have done a left hepatectomy, and uh, you can see that the portal vein here is resected. I think you can see some sutures here, resected and anastomosis. Uh, so this is a right hepatic duct, and this is a right hepatic artery. So uh, this kind of aggressive resections can be done in patients with hyalocholangiocarcinoma uh, with vascular invasion. And after that, this patient should be followed up with chemotherapy. <clears throat> so uh, pre if we talk about preoperative workup, uh, either for HCG or cholangiocarcinoma, uh, multiphase uh, CT or MRI is essential. And uh, as a, uh, to exclude distance, distant meds, chest CT uh, is done. I mean, non-contrast CT enough to assess uh, lung meds. And uh, CA19-9, alpha to 14 and CA also done. In certain group of patients with uh, heptocholangios, uh, alpha to 14 is elevated. Uh, it's a very small uh, group of patients. And uh, if, if it is not for resection, and if it is, say if there are multiple lesions or if, or if the patient is not fit, uh, it is, biopsy is considered for palliation, before palliation. So uh, as we all know, the tumor markers in cholangiocarcinoma CA19-9 and uh, uh, And biopsy is not necessary uh, if the uh, if the patient is uh, can be subjected for uh, surgical resection, but if it is for uh, palliation, as I told you before, uh, you should uh, do a biopsy. And uh, goal of surgery is R node resection, uh, and patients who undergo resection have the best survival. Uh, five years survival is about twenty to forty percent uh, due to the aggressiveness or of these tumors. So treatment options for metastatic or unresectable disease, as I told you before, it's mainly palliative chemotherapy. And there are certain trials that could uh, have done transarterial chemoembolization and uh, uh, yttrium, uh, uh, yttrium injections. So these are also possible and it gives a better uh, overall survival in these patients. And uh, ablative techniques like radiofrequency ablation, microwave ablation also can be considered in these patients. So, uh, so I talked about primary liver lesions, mainly HCG and cholangiocarcinoma before. Now I'll talk, I'll talk about uh, liver metastasis. So liver, as we all know, liver is a common site for metastatic deposits. It is only second to lymph nodes. And uh, metastatic lesions account for about 70% of malignant liver tumors. So this is a picture of a uh, large bowel which contains a bowel cancer and uh, in the liver, this is a right row of the liver which containing a liver mint. So, so this is another picture of a, a liver, this is a left lateral segment which containing a liver mint. You can see that there is central umbilication and uh, looks there are typical features of a metastasis present in this specimen. So, uh, bit about colorectal liver meds. Uh, so initially we thought that having liver meds in uh, colorectal cancer is, has a very uh, bad, uh, I mean, that is the end of the story for most of the patient initially. But now uh, we consider in, uh, patients with mu even multiple liver meds uh, are considered for liver resection. And there is a uh, well-established data uh, that could improve the survival and even in even cure in uh, open confined disease right so the surgery is the uh, only potentially curative treatment for colorectal liver meds and overall five year survival is more than 55% and 10 year survival is about 30% so there is clear evidence that 
uh, liver resection in colorectal nets uh, improves survival. So as we all know, uh, colorectal cancer is the third most commonly diagnosed cancer worldwide and uh, second leading cause of liver-related death, uh, cancer-related uh, death, and the liver is the most common site of metastasis. Uh, more than 50% of patients who has colorectal cancers will develop uh, liver metastasis, and uh, patients with liver mets, the five-year survival is about 50% after resection. So patients presenting with uh, primary colorectal cancer and liver nets, uh, either synchronous uh, surgery can be uh, simultaneous bowel and liver resection can be considered or staged uh, bowel or liver in two different locations can be resected. And uh, it depends on the patient. Uh, usually as a rule, uh, if you are doing a left-sided uh, bowel resection, say anterior resection, uh, uh, we would not do a liver reset, major liver resection at the same moment, uh, same occasion, because uh, the uh, because there are two high risk surgeries happening at the same uh, occasion. So we would stage it in two different levels. Maybe we would do the liver first, and later on we would do the bowel. So it all depending on the uh, patient and tumor factors. So when do we consider a uh, 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 liver first? Uh, if the uh, bowel tumor is not non-obstructive and there are no symptoms from the bowel lesion and there's no threat, threat that it could uh, uh, be locally advanced uh, due to delay, we would consider liver first because, uh, uh, because uh, before giving chemotherapy, liver resection is always advisable because after giving chemo, uh, livers become fatty and chemo induced fatty liver offers uh, and liver injury offers, then it will be difficult to do a liver resection and also after chemo these tumors might respond completely and it will be difficult to find afterwards so always uh, you prefer to resect the liver first if the primary is asymptomatic and it is controlled so uh, so resection is a gold standard for primary and secondary uh, hepatic tumors. Uh, limitations uh, so uh, in any case of uh, liver resection limitations are so we have to uh, see the tumor factors and the background liver. If the background liver is good, and we can remove the tumor safely, and there will be a, a future liver remnant or after resection, if there is adequate perfused liver tissue is left, uh, 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 it can be removed safely. So uh, the second uh, common uh, uh, tumor which could give to liver mets is neuroendocrine tumors. So neuroendocrine tumors can origin from different parts of the GI tract, including a uh, small bubble, pancreas, and uh, it can give uh, metastasis to liver. And the other group of uh, tumors are non-colorectal, non-neuroendocrine liver metastasis. These are basically the tumors which arrive from esophagus, stomach. Uh, so these or general urinary tract, these uh, are breast cancer. So there is uh, very less data on these uh, uh, kind of uh, tumors giving rise to liver nets and uh, metastatectomy or liver resection following these tumors uh, have not much long-term survival because the aggressiveness of these tumors. So uh, a bit about uh, Neuroendocrine liver mets. Uh, so as I told you before, uh, in the GI tract, mainly uh, from pancreatic islet cells and bowel, uh, small bowel, uh, neuroendocrine tumors can give rise to liver mets. It's a spectrum of disease. So uh, in pancreatic peanuts or pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, uh, mainly can be insulinomas, glucagonomas, uh, somatostatinomas. So depending on the uh, the tumor type, it can give different uh, presentations. For example, insulinomas may present with uh, fainting attacks or recurrent hypoglycemic attacks. And uh, likewise, uh, uh, different tumors would give different symptom profile. Uh, interesting thing about these neuroendocrine tumors, in, uh, they are hyper-enhancing solid lesions in CT. So it lights up in uh, CT scan arterial phase. Uh, similar uh, as neuroendocrine tumors, uh, 
renal cell carcinoma deposits also can give same picture uh, in CT scan. So uh, symptomatology mainly related to the type of tumor and uh, the where it originates. In small bowel, it might present as a uh, small bowel obstruction or it can be uh, symptoms related to the neuroendocrine tumor. And it, it's a part of uh, multiple endocrine nucleus here. So uh, special scans done in these kind of patients, the somatostatin receptor scintigraphy, uh, which is not available in Sri Lanka. So, uh, and uh, gallium uh, dotted uh, PET scans. So these are not available in Sri Lanka, but uh, with these, we can uh, accurately diagnose uh, where the primary and the uh, metastasis is. So uh, treatment options for neuroendocrine liver meds. Uh, surgery is the uh, uh, treatment of choice, so which can remove the primary as well as the meds. And uh, uh, operative goal is to completely clear, uh, cure the, uh, clear the disease. But in patients with multiple uh, liver meds. Uh, if the patients are symptomatic, if we can do at least 90% of uh, cyto uh, reduction, it is helpful in these patients because it will help to control the symptoms associated with neuroendocrine tumors. So uh, medical therapies uh, to, for patients who are unable to toler tolerate a cure, curative resection, usually stoma somatostatin analogs are given uh, to control the disease and chem embolization and radioembolization also documented to give favorable results. So, as I told you before, uh, non -col uh, colorectal, non neuroendocrine liver meds, which would originate from breast melanomas, sarcomas, G U tract, gastric, esophagus, they have a uh, inferior survival compared to uh, other uh, metastases I described before because of their tumor biology. So surgical resection for non-colorectal, non-endocrine liver meds uh, is uh, considered limited because of the uh, da data is limited as well as resection in this patient would not give very good survival. So it is not considered, but maybe it can be considered in young patients in selected case cases, it can be that. So, uh, uh, what are the options in any liver cancer? You can, uh, what are the surgical options? So, surgical option, we can remove part of the liver, either right epilectomy or left epilectomy, or non anatomical resection. We can remove few segments of the liver. Uh, and there are special procedures like ALPS, which I would talk to you about later. Uh, so, in these cases, uh, we would aim for one centimeter margin and even if it is R0 resection that is accepted. So uh, in first picture shows that if you can see this is the liver and there is a small uh, area is uh, taken off. So this is a non anatomical liver resection. And on the right hand side you can see only the left lobe of the liver and the right lobe of the liver is taken off. So this is a right epitectomy. So these are the options in different liver cancers. So uh, this is not a very clear picture. It's uh, about ALPS. So in ALPS, it's a staged procedure. So uh, ALPS is mainly uh, done in patients with uh, marginal liver volume. See, if there's a very big tumor in the liver, and if you remove it, the rest of the liver will be not adequate for the patient. So what uh, in ALPS uh, we would do is we would uh, resect the parenchyma and tie the portal vein leave the blood supply through hepatic artery and we don't remove the tumor in the first go and we leave it for about uh, 12 days or two weeks then the good part of the liver will hypertrophy after that in the second stage you would go in and remove the tumor uh, involving segment so that is called ALS procedure so uh, so those are the new techniques that would use in uh, multiple or uh, multiple liver meds and as well as when the residual liver volume is not enough. Uh, so in extrahepatic uh, metastasis, say if there are lung meds uh, or other metastasis, what would you do? 
So in certain groups of patients, like young patients with small lung nodules, which are chemosensitive, uh, liver resection can be considered in these patients with cool rectal nets, and uh, they, they are, they are re, it can be, can give good results right, if the lung nets are chemosensitive. And in a scenario where there is solitary or few uh, lung nets, bo uh, both liver and lung nets can be resected and they have a survival benefit. So when you get a patient uh, with a liver disease, uh, in the history, uh, mainly you should consider on uh, viral hepati hepatitis and previous blood transfusions and basic things like that. And examination would be look for jaundice, ascites, uh, and evidence of poor hypertension. And these patients can uh, should undergo colonoscopy and upper GI to exclude any other problems. And uh, these are the basic investigations out of these uh, in liver functions, mainly uh, bilirubin liver and PTINR is very important. And in a full blood count, plate blood count, uh, less than 100,000 would indicate total hypertension. And uh, tumor markers like carcinogenic antigen, CA19-9, alpha fetal protein are essential uh, uh, in, uh, when you are screening for a tumor. And child's class and male school are functional schools that uh, would, uh, uh, would use in to assess the severity of liver disease in these patients. And uh, assessment of nutritional status, mainly albumin and a six minute walking distance test and hand grip is used uh, even for liver resections as well as for liver transplantation. So if we talk about imaging, so ultrasound scan is a very good uh, uh, imaging technique for liver cancers because uh, you can easily see the tumors. But uh, investigation of choices, triphasic, uh, concurs, and CT. And in uh, doubtful cases, uh, MRI liver can be considered and uh, it can detect smaller lesions and uh, it can be compared with the CT and come to a, arrive at a diagnosis. And uh, PET scan, are also considered in uh, selected patients, uh, especially with cool rectal nets, to plan the uh, treatment strategies. So PET is uh, indicated in uh, to evaluate equivocal lesions and to diagnose extra hepatic uh, metastasis. And uh, PET scan is not very accurate for very small lesions, so at least it should be more than one centimeter to detect in a PET scan. So this is an image of a, a, a colorectal liver net, which lights up in a PET scan. This is the left lobe of the liver, and this is the tube. So uh, preoperative biopsy is not indicated uh, unless there is a doubt uh, in uh, the diagnosis or if we are not offering surgery or if we are palliating the patient. Uh, so, FLR is the future liver remnant. So, future li liver remnant is uh, once you subject a patient to a liver resection, uh, what is left behind after the resection. So, future liver remnant is, uh, 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 is deciding the post-operative outcome of a patient. If the future liver remnant is very small after resection, this patient will go into liver failure and they will die. So, uh, so before surgery, we have to always plan how much liver is left and whether it's properly vascularized as well as it is, whether it is adequate to the body mass index, right? And the, and the quality of the liver is also important. If the leftover liver is uh, fibrous or, cirrhos uh, or cirrhosis, then uh, the function wouldn't be as expected. So as an example, say now, this patient has already established cirrhosis. So if you remove about 70% of this liver, this patient will die of uh, liver failure. So it's always the quality of the liver also should be taken into consideration. So uh, this is uh, roughly a guide, how much future liver remnant should be left. So uh, if you can see at the bottom of this table, uh, in patients with fibrosis and cirrhosis, at least 40% of the liver should be left. You can resect only about uh, 60%. Uh, 
but uh, in the topmost uh, line say patient with a normal liver you can reset up to 80 percent of the liver and you can leave about 20 percent to the patient so it's uh, the if the liver quality is not good that at least 40 to 50 percent of the liver should be left uh, after resection so uh, the hepatic mold strategies that is uh, how to improve the liver volume in marginal patients so there are different surgical techniques uh, that would uh, consider in a patients with marginal liver volumes so uh, one of these techniques is portal vein embolization say now there's a, a tumor in the right lobe of the liver and uh, if you plan on a resection if you remove the right lobe of the liver the leftover liver is not adequate in a patient so what we can do is we can before the surgery radiologically we can, we can embolize the portal vein right portal vein so when we embolize the right portal vein uh, right uh, lobe of the liver is only supplied by the right hepatic artery and there are intra uh, parenchymal cross connections are there so if you wait for six weeks uh, and if you do another scan and see uh, the left lobe of the liver is hypertrophic because when we embolize the right uh, portal vein, there is more blood flow to the left lobe of the uh, liver and it will hypertrophy. So our liver volume is increased. So we can go and reset the right lobe safely after the liver volume is increased. So I described you before about the uh, HALPS procedure. So HALPS procedure also, it's same principle that uh, you partition the liver, tie the portal vein and leave for only two weeks so in alps procedure you can uh, achieve the desired uh, size of the liver uh, uh, desired size of the liver uh, in uh, few days time compared to portal vein embolization so this is about portal vein embolization so uh, there is average increase of 12 percent uh, in future liver remnant uh, after portal vein embolization, but it takes about six weeks. And another uh, important thing is uh, during the six, six weeks, if we do uh, serial CT scans, we can uh, see serial CT scans, and if we assess the liver volume, we can have an idea about the liver growth rate. And there are a lot of studies saying that if the liver growth rate is about 2.66 percent per week. That these patients have a very good outcome after resection. So two-stage hepatectomy is that uh, if uh, mainly in bilobe liver disease, so we can uh, in one one surgery we can remove right-sided tumors, and uh, after about uh, two weeks we can do the other side or the left side and uh, remove the left side tumors. So these are in bilobe disease. You can do uh, clear the liver in different stages. So uh, I described you before about the arterial direct therapy uh, embolization. Uh, commonly, uh, transarterial chemo embolization is done uh, for hepatocellular carcinomas, and now it is tried for colorectal cancers and uh, even for neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, mainly, doxorubicin, cisplatin, and mitomycin is used. Uh, so TASE also can be used as a bridging therapy for patients who are awaiting transplant list. And uh, it is also uh, uh, used for symptomatic relief. Say, uh, if there are hepatocellular carcinoma which can, cannot be resected, which is near to uh, capsules, and if there is risk of uh, perforation or rupture, uh, we can offer uh, taste. So, the limitations are extensive liver nets involving both loops of the liver and major vessel involvement, let's say portal vein thrombosis, are contraindications for taste procedure. Uh, so after taste procedure, adverse effects or the complications, mainly the post embolization syndrome, about 10% of patients, they will come with right hypochondriac pain, nausea, vomiting, and fever with elevated uh, defense sense, but this is self-limiting uh, within about one week. Serious complications like tumor rupture, abscess formation, uh, pulmonary embolism can be occur, that is rare. So, uh, outcome of TASE is like it gives a medium, median survival of about 34 months. So, uh, TASE is a good option in patients who are not uh, surgical candidates. 
So radioactive particles uh, like yttrium 90 uh, can be used. Uh, this is better than TASE and it can be used in multiple tumors as well as larger tumors. Uh, it's not currently available in our country. And ablative techniques, uh, are mainly RFA, cryoablation and microwave ablation. So we aim for a margin of 0.5 to 1 centimeter. Uh, so radiofrequency ablation, which is most frequently used, thermoablative technique, uh, which kills tumor by coagulative necrosis and uh, uh, reaches temperatures of 60 Celsius and causes protein denaturation. And it can be used in uh, small lesions, less than three centimeter. A number of lesions, uh, mainly uh, as a guide, we are using about three lesions uh, per session. So radio frequency ablation is for unresectable uh, primary liver tumors. Colorectal and neuroendocrine tumors are also ablated, and it can be a bridging for uh, transplant. Uh, so main complications are like there can be thermal damage to biliary structures, and they might come in a uh, come with a bile leak after uh, after ablation. And other thing is if there are close by uh, close by bubble. The uh, heat can be uh, transmitted to bowel and they can come up with perforation and these are life-threatening. So microwave ablation is a neighbor's technique uh, which uses uh, electromagnetic uh, energy or microwave energy and it can be done under CT or MRI or ultrasound guided. So the mechanism of action is it, ca it causes agitation of water molecules uh, in the tumor tissue creating friction and heat. And uh, unlike uh, RFA, microwave can be used in closer to bile ducts and vessels. It doesn't mean that it doesn't transmit heat energy, but it is safer compared to RFA. And uh, it does not cause desiccation and charring as in uh, RFA, which would limit the conduction of uh, energy. So uh, microwave ablation is comparatively better uh, than RFA. Uh, so, uh, microwave uh, ablation can be done in colorectal meds, unresectable HCC, and neuroendocrine meds as well. So, com uh, complications uh, it can also cause by leaks, bleeding, liver abscess, and pain. Uh, and if they get infected, they can get uh, abscess formation and come up with uh, septic symptoms. So uh, if we talk about outcomes, uh, so if the tumor size is less than four centimeters, mainly if it is less than three centimeters, it is almost equal to uh, surgical resection because it can be completely ablated. Uh, and another option is percutaneous ethanol injection. Uh, so patients who, who are not candidates for surgery and for microwave ablation, if, the, if there is a uh, overlying bubble loop or there is a important structure which is close by, which would be damaged by heat uh, energy, we can uh, subject them to ethanol injection. So that is, ethanol injection is, uh, uh, is favor favorable for very small lesions. So complications are the same as the others. And uh, as this, I talked about the future liver, sorry. So uh, previously I talked about the future liver remnant. Uh, I told you that uh, if the healthy livers, you can reset up to 80%. And if the liver is cirrhotic or chemotherapy induced uh, liver damage is present, at least 40% of the liver it should be uh, kept. And uh, so uh, other important thing is now, as I told you before, uh, chemotherapy, uh, if you take chemotherapy for more than 12 weeks, uh, these patients uh, will get chemotherapy induced liver injury and they present with uh, uh, and the liver quality will be very bad. So these patients, when we subject them to liver resection, at least 40% of liver should be left. So this is a picture of, see now, this liver it doesn't look normal. It has like bluish and uh, dark areas. So this is a post-chemotherapy liver. So these kind of livers, there is a fat deposition as well as there is a evidence on liver injury. So higher volume of liver should be left uh, after resection, if not, this patient will go into liver failure and they will die. Uh, so, functional assessment of the liver. So, I told you before uh, that mainly uh, MELD score is used. Uh, so, it's a combination of bilirubin, INR, and creatinine. 
So MELD score of nine uh, can be considered safe for hepatic resection. And MELD score is also used as a guide to identify or screen patients for liver transplant as well. Uh, child score is also another uh, functional score, which uh, mainly composed of uh, presence of SIDs, encephalopathy, bilirubin, INR, and albumin. Uh, this is used to categorize patients into childs A, B, and C. Uh, so childs A is considered for resection. A and B can be used for A and B and C can be used for transplant, but child C is, uh, is uh, not for surgical intervention because uh, after resection they will go into liver failure. So these are functional scores to identify the suitability for transplant or any intervention. So other important thing is uh, even in imaging, uh, if there is evidence of portal hypertension, so you would see it imaging in, in, in imaging you can see if there is uh, splenomegaly and if there are high varices are present, these are the signs of portal hypertension. So uh, and in full blood count, if you check the plate blood count, if it is less than hundred thousand, that is uh, evidence of portal hypertension. So if a patient is having Evidence of portal hypertension, these patients are not considered for liver resection because they will bleed and they go to liver failure after surgery. So uh, lastly, the important thing about uh, how to assess uh, uh, the function, uh, functional status of the liver is uh, endocyanin green. So endocyanin green is a uh, agent that you would give intravenous and uh, then you would assess how the liver clears this I ICG, right? So uh, this would give a uh, idea about the functional status of the functional capacity of the liver. So if you inject ICG and uh, less than ten percent at fifteen minutes uh, is a good indicator that this patient would can stand a radical surgery. So ICG clearance is done in other countries. But at the moment, uh, we are not practicing that. But it's a good method to uh, assess the functional status of the uh, liver. So uh, lastly, uh, some few principles. So any liver tumor, uh, complete removal is uh, should be done if there is curative intention and should obtain negative margins. And uh, leftover liver should be properly vascularized and there should be proper biliary drainage to uh, survive the leftover liver. And uh, unlike other surgeries, uh, multidisciplinary team discussions and proper planning uh, is essential in these kind of complex surgeries. And imaging, uh, proper imaging should be done and should be discussed properly before embarking on these kind of uh, complex surgeries. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir for that very concise lecture on the treatment options currently available for liver cancers and for updating us on new information. We have a few queries from the audience. And the first question is, the percentages of occurrence of primary and secondary tumors in the liver? Yeah. So second, uh, I think I had mentioned in the uh, about 70% of the secondary tumor. So most commonly it's uh, yes. Second question, uh, what are the causes for high alpha protein levels? Are the causes? Uh, so, mainly uh, it's a uh, hepatocellular causes. And uh, uh, even established cirrhosis, they can have high alpha protein level, but we should do imaging to explore any existing uh, liver tumor. So, if the imaging says, uh, if you do proper imaging and if there are no uh, liver tumors, so it may be due to associated cirrhosis. The next question is, uh, can we go for liver transplant for a patient who is diagnosed with portal hypertension? Yes, so diagnosed uh, patient with established portal hypertension is an indication for transplant. So these uh, patients with established portal hypertension, they might have any, they might have any uh, bleeding, uh, varicell bleeding, and they might be having signs of decompensation, including SIDs. 
So, so intractable the side is also, also another cause for uh, indication for liver transplant. And, uh, so, so yes, portal hypertension is a indication. Yes. The next question is, sir, what are the places or resources available for tests? In Sri Lanka, there, there are like in uh, Ravan and uh, National Hospital, uh, tests can be safely done. Uh, it's commonly done procedure. Right. The next question is: Can metastatic cholangiocarcinoma patients undergo surgery after chemotherapy? And also, is there a case in liver transplant for these cholangiocarcinoma patients? So, for cholangiocarcinoma, liver transplant is very limited. Uh, in Mayo Clinic, they do very selective patients with the hyalocholangiocarcinoma because it's present of tumor and they would uh, recur in a uh, few years after, uh, not few years, few months after transplant. So, in, in, uh, in multifocal cholangiocarcinoma, uh, surgery is contraindicated because uh, even if you reset, they, they will recur in a uh, few months' time. So, it's mainly palliative chemotherapy. Next question, sir. The place for chemoembolization in liver mix due to colorectal carcinoma. Yeah, so here we have a practice that uh, case for colorectal cancer, but there is a lot of uh, articles on, uh, on the case for colorectal liver mix. But I think uh, if you can do a safe reception, that is the best option for colorectal liver mix. Uh, the final question, sir. Uh, is CA99 specific for liver tumors? No, it's for mainly cholangiocarcinomas and pancreatic cancer. So that's the questions for today, sir. Uh, we have posted the certificate on our chat link for you all uh, to fill in and get the e-certificate. And uh, lastly, I would like to thank, sir, for coming today even with many family commitments to be with us today and to arrange and conduct this very successful webinar. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Have a good Sunday and a beautiful weekend.